Hey everybody, this is Aaron Harris, host of the Football Odyssey, and today I want to talk to you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go and download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome, everyone, to the Football Odyssey. This is your host, Aaron Harris. Today's episode will be an interview with Cody Alexander, the co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach at Mesquite Horn High School and the author of five defensive football books. Cody and I discuss his journey within the game of football, how the game has evolved over time, and his book, Hybrids, The Making of a Modern Defense. If you're interested in buying one of his books, I've attached the link in the description, and I've also included links to his daily blog called Match Quarters and a link to his Twitter account. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the episode, and let me know what you think of our conversation. And, as always, thank you for listening. All right, cool, man. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you reaching out. Yeah, man, I was a fan of the book because I'm someone who really enjoys seeing the prog- uh, the progression of football and how it's played and kind of like how the rules have progressed since, you know, the 1880s and kind of like where we are now and basically like how rules kind of influence strategy and vice versa. And when I started reading your book, you know, you got like a lot of information packed in. I loved it. And I like how you start the book, too. You go, time is a flat circle. Everything we have done or will do, we will do over and over and over again forever. And that's from Russ Colin, True Detective, which yeah. is Matt McConaughey's character. Are you a big True Detective fan? Oh, yeah. That season by far is one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite just TV in general that I've ever watched. And, and that that line kept popping up when I was doing research for hybrids it just kept popping up and I just was like I gotta put this in the book this has to be the lead the lead just to the book so that's why I ended up picking it because that that when he said that it just resonated with me is that you know in almost anything we do though we are moving forward in time that we continue to spiral I'm a history teacher so when I teach history I I teach it and I tell them like you're gonna watch like at the beginning of US history you'll see that we'll cycle back through everything that even though we're moving forward that a lot of the main issues that we have today we've always had they're just framed in a different context and a different setting and so therefore we think that they're new like one of the fun things that I do with the kids is when I taught US history was to go through immigration in the United States and how that it's always been an issue and so, but we think of it as such a, because of our recency bias that it's always like, it's, this is the only issue that's, this is brand new and it's not. So good looking at it in terms of a historical context, I try in almost all of my books to kind of give a historical context of where this came from, because I do think it's important to understand where we come from in order to understand where we're going, because the past gives us a kind of a map for the future. Uh, and so to me, that's kind of where it came from. And that quote, obviously, I think it's just it hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And that's something that throughout the book, you really allude to a lot about how a lot of the things that we're doing now, whether it's a sort of variation of the under defense or whether it was the three, four, you know, some variation or predecessor has been tried in the past. And when it kind of reappears, it always seems like it's a fresh idea. But in reality, it's been experimented with going back to even the early 1900s. Yeah, like uh, for instance, like all the the three high Tampa two stuff, 
uh, that Iowa State started about around 2017. It, and really, they're not the first to do it. Most most odd stack teams have been doing some variation of it. They just decided to base in, in kind of almost this Tampa two, whereas a lot of a lot of those odd stack teams are cover one or cover three base just because they're it's odd. So they they don't have a natural adjuster. Um, and, and that's kind of the interesting thing that I've always seen is a lot of odd stack coaches always hit me up like, Hey, how can I do this? I'm an odd, I'm an odd stack guy. How can I, how can I run quarters to this? So it's just interesting to me, you know, the Tampa two variation. Well, it's not really any different than what the Tampa two teams were doing from an under front in the early two thousands. They just took the Mike backer and moved them back. I mean, the light box stuff that you're seeing with the Rams, it's, it's a real similar. I mean, odd stack, coaches are looking at the Rams with their five, one box. Like, man, we've been, we've been doing this forever, you know? So it, to me, it's just always, you always have to look at it in context. I always try and tell people, you know, there no singular play or no singular clip is, uh, or scheme is in a vacuum. Like there's always a reason behind it. And that's what I'm always trying to find is the historical context behind it. And then, you know, kind of how that's going to play out into the future and how, how it, meshes with a lot of different you know philosophies of defense yeah i think one of the most recent or not most recent one of the most notable examples of how what old becomes new is when the wildcat took storm back in i think 2008 you know people were saying um you know running backs be able to line up where the quarterback usually lines up in the shotgun and you had jet sweeps and you had a lot of innovative plays but then you had a lot of people came out saying look they were doing this back in you know the 1920s and if not before so yeah i mean slot t guys are looking at it like yeah that's you know you're just running the wing t or the slot t from a gun your quarterback is now a running back which in in those at the high school level the quarterback's always been the running back he's been your best athlete um, and I think that's interesting. You know, Art Bryles won a bowl game with no quarterbacks and uh, Gene Chizik had no idea how to stop the slot T. And that's essentially what they did. I think they set some NCAA record for rushing yards in a game. And it was unreal. And all he was doing was running the slot T, something that he had ran when he was a kid and then kind of cutting his teeth as a coach. So to me, I, I you know, the this stuff pops up in the NFL and that obviously that's when it becomes notable because that's the highest level of football. It's the most eyes are on it, but it's such a rigid set of rules played in the NFL. And it's such a, this is the way that football is played. So when things like that happen, uh, then it kind of gets everybody kind of in a tizzy. But I will say this about the NFL is that it, it doesn't take them very long to figure out how to stop it, you know, cause it, there's a lot of money involved in it. They better figure out how to stop it or they're not going to be there. Um, but at the same time too, you got kind of this huge group think of, of really smart people. It, you know, usually you would hope that it's the elite of the elite or coaching the NFL. And so to me, you know, that's why I think it's important to kind of always understand where this stuff comes from so that you don't get caught off guard if you see something new, but also, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, if you understand kind of how people are going to play you and how what your beaters are you almost can look into the future so you have an idea of what you need to be able to get done hey if they start doing this this is what we need to check to so you kind of have this eye of into the future by understanding kind of what is going to what is going to play out uh, against you yeah, and it seems like at least at the NFL level, when they want answers, they kind of look down to college and down to high school even. Because, I mean, went back in 2012, I think, when the pistol formation had come into the NFL and you had guys like RG3 and then Kaepernick and, um, you know, you had a lot of great teams that were running great read option plays and everything like that. And it took a little while for them to really get it. But you saw more and more that they were going to the college game and having coaching sessions with, um, you know, different coaches in the college level to try to see how did you guys defend this when they were in college and see how can we adapt it to the pro game? Yeah. And, you know, that's a, I've always, you know, I've told the story several times just when I was at Baylor, I was able to go to visit the Broncos when uh, Manning was installing the the pistol stuff, him and him and Adam, and Adam Gase were installing the pistol at Denver. Uh, one of the things from that was that was the year after RG3 had gone to the NFL, Colin Kaepernick, and so, you know, everybody's like, okay, what about this pistol, this zone option stuff that, that, you know, the NFL just hadn't seen. 
mm-hmm. you know, how are you defending this? And, you know, I always thought it was, you know, I always chuckled because I was like, this is day one option rules that you got to know on defense, especially if you're going to defend something like the Art Bryles system. So, you know, it, it, as a young coach sitting there and, and, and being able to meet with, you know, uh, Jack Del Rio and, and Coach Fox at, at for for the Broncos at the time, you know, it's just sitting there saying like, yeah, they probably haven't had to defend the option since at least the eighties, you know, Fox was, Fox was at Iowa state back in the eighties. And so to me, it's like, you know, Jack Del Rio probably hadn't seen the option since, since he played. So, you know, you, when you, it's not part of your, you know, ecosystem, you just have no idea, but you know, they were very interested in finding it out. What are, you know, and, and it, I thought it was very interesting that, you know, and, and kind of cool to be able to sit in a room and hear them talk about it and when that and being part of something that of, that was at the beginning of that. So, yeah, you know, it, you know, the evolution of the game, I think RPOs again at the NFL level are, is going to be something that that is is just going to gain more traction. The option routes have always been there in the West Coast offense. Now what you're doing is you're kind of giving it a little bit more teeth because now you've got that run action behind it. That's something that, you know, the NFL just really hadn't hadn't really had to deal with. And so now they're taking the option from the quarterback because, again, you don't want to run the quarterback in the NFL as much as, as you would in the college game just because, I mean, you're paying that guy millions and millions of dollars. And then yeah. for him to get hit on one play, you know, I mean, obviously Lamar Jackson has proven that you can run. There's other quarterbacks that have been able to, you know, Russell Wilson has been able to do it. Uh, Dak Prescott here in, here in Dallas has been able to do it. Um, but I do think that it's something that, uh, the NFL teams don't necessarily have to worry about on an every down deal. Yeah, well, a couple of years ago or the 2019 season when the Bills were playing the Texans and it was on the opening drive in the uh, wild card where Josh Allen had went out for a pass. I, I don't remember if he caught it or not, but, you know, the commentators and ESPN had talked about, oh, so now we have a triple threat quarterback. And you kind of like wonder, you know, if you ever could we ever realistically get to a point where you could have all five or six skill position players on an offense that could take a snap one uh, play at quarterback and then the next moment he's at receiver then the next moment he's at tight end and kind of have that revolving door in a, in a sense I think I, I don't think so and the only reason why I would say that is just because the quarterback position now has evolved to the point where it's just it's too important I think being able to throw the ball has become too important that why would you take your best thrower uh, and move him around I do think that in terms of expanding the playbook and having options in there and having an athletic quarterback that can do some different things, I think is important nowadays. Mm-hmm. Now you see the NFL, they don't want a statue in the pocket. You know, I think like a guy like Tom Brady, if he was coming out now, now obviously he wasn't a highly touted quarterback when he came out, but you know, if you look at a guy like him now, everybody's kind of like, well, he doesn't really move. How are we going to, how are we going to, uh, you know, deal with that? So I think now we've gotten to the point where everybody needs at least a mobile quarterback. You know, and I think guys like Elway and Steve Young are looking at the NFL today and be like, man, I was born in the wrong era. Yeah. You know, even even a guy like Jim Kelly, I think people forget Jim Kelly was a hell of a middle linebacker in, in high school. You know, he could have played either quarterback or middle linebacker. So, I mean, I, th- I think that you know, especially that 83 class is, is special guys like McNabb and McNair, uh, mm-hmm. Mike Vick was probably, if, if they could play now, I think you would see a completely different dynamic. I think you would see a completely different playbook. I think people would have been, you know, even with, uh, I, you know, I even go back to RG three and some of the struggles he had at the beginning of his career of just kind of with Shanahan and, and trying to fit in an NFL system and things like that, like guys like that, you know, even just five years ago, you know, 10 years ago, how that, how, what would have happened and if they would have been able to play now and how that would have changed things. So I, I do think that there's a little bit of hesitation in running the quarterback just because of how much money they're getting, but you can't, I think most of the NFL has understand now that you, you have to have some sort of a quarterback that can escape and that can, that can move the pocket. Yeah, and, and there's a smart way to do it, right? I mean, yes. that's how Russell Wilson has been able to last this long without any major injury. You know, these guys know when to slide. They know when not to take the extra hits. You know, obviously, 10, 15 years ago, you would have been criticized for not lowering your shoulder and trying to get that extra yard. But today, it's a totally different game. And because they're getting paid so much, you understand why these guys are kind of, you know, picking and choosing their punishment, I guess you could say. 
Yeah, and and I think that's the thing. Like even with Lamar Jackson, you know, uh, you know the kick, the guy never really takes a hit, and I think that that's kind of the that kind of that running back as a quarterback type deal. You know, I think that would have probably been kind of had Tebow been able to stay in the game, that probably would have been one of the knocks on him. Is that man, he's just taken all these massive hits. Yeah, he's a big dude, but he's really a fullback playing quarterback. Um, and so I think, you know, that's the thing with like like a guy like Josh Allen. You know, yeah, he's a big body, but again, you don't want him taking you don't want him taking all those hits. So I think it will be interesting um, in the next ten years to be to be able to look back at all these young quarterbacks that are coming up. This this class of young quarterbacks a decade later and see where they are at their you know early thirties, mid thirties, even forties with some of these quarterbacks. You know, with like Breeze and Brady playing until they're forty. I mean, so now it'll be interesting to see in a decade kind of where the game has evolved with them being able to run and then all these kind of younger quarterbacks that have all that have all come up in a spread kind of mobile quarterback kind of ecosystem in the lower levels. Yeah, and I think we've seen that it, it certainly is possible. Like when you had Mike Vick when he was in Philadelphia, because, you know, when he was in Atlanta, you know, basically the, the offense that was tailored around him was basically everybody go deep and then mm-hmm. if they're playing man coverage, you just take off. And the mass, you know, man yeah. offense. Yeah, 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 precisely. Yeah. And, you know, it, it worked well for, you know, a lot of years. Right. And then whenever he came back and played for Philly, he really kind of showed that he can kind of stay in the pocket, go through his reads and throw it. Um, so, I, yeah, it's definitely going to be curious to see how many of these guys are still anxious to take off and run versus how many of them are going to become more of a pure pocket passer that's going to use their mobility to their advantage. But I, I just think with the, with the game today and the amount of coaching that's going into the game, you know, you're going to have guys that are going to be able to conform, I think, easily. Right. So before we go deeper into the book, um, can you take me through your journey within football in terms of how you were first exposed to the game and what ultimately motivated you to become a coach? Yeah, I mean, my my dad, who's my best friend, I talk to him every day. Um, He was a coach. He loved football. Um, and so just from the beginning stages of my life, all, all we did was, was watch football, talk about football. You know, I remember being, um, I remember being a third grader and playing soccer and baseball. And I'm just like, I got that first taste of, of football and I was like, I'm done. I don't want to do anything else. Um, and so, you know, that to me was something that was something that I was able to do with my father. Uh, being able to talk to him. He's an offensive coach by trade. He's been an offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach for a long, long time. And so for me, you know, learning that offensive side of the, of the ball and then playing nothing but defense. I mean, I really didn't, I really never played a lot of offense growing up. I always played defense. You know, just where I, where I grew up in, in Liberty, Missouri, they put all the best players on defense. And so I just, I never played offense. And so having that kind of, that kind of dual duality of being able to go home and talk to my dad about offense. But then as a defensive player, having that resource kind of just really made me fall in love with the incomplete game. I always wanted to coach. uh, And then obviously the, the path of least resistance is to become a teacher in that sense. You know, my, I love my dad, but he's not, he didn't coach college. He's not a famous guy around, you know, so I, I really didn't have a lot of options in terms of, um, after college, I played four years. Um, I kind of hopped around a little bit. Um, I finished my career at Southern Nazarene in Oklahoma. And I, you know, I had expressed to my coaches that, you know, I wanted to coach college. I, I didn't want to GA or work at the school that I graduated from. Um, I wanted to kind of branch out and go and I, it just wasn't an opportunity. So I was able to get um, my first coaching job at Deer Creek in Oklahoma. And that kind of really sparked my interest at, at, the, at just, I really loved coaching. You know, I, I didn't know how that transition was going to be from playing to coaching and, 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 and I really enjoyed it. And then from there I got, you know, my wife is from, from Dallas. And so Texas is kind of the king down here. And so I, the first opportunity I could get, I got, and it just, I worked at a really small school as a first year varsity program. Um, and we were not good at all. And, and just getting beat every week, but seeing the kids try so hard, it was really inspiring. And, and it really inspired me to kind of like, look, these kids know that they're not going to win every, every week. 
but they give their heart out and they do it. And, and, you know, how can I sit here and not give my all for my dream? And so from there, I was like, I got to coach college football. And so I, the, the only way I figured that I could do it, I didn't know anybody. I was like, look, I'm just going to enroll in a master's program. And then I'm just going to get into school. And then that way that when I'm on campus, they can't tell me no, like I'll just show up, like I'll find a way, um, do whatever it takes. And so kind of having that attitude and that, that, you know, having parents that support you, having a wife who was, it was my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, a longtime girlfriend of just being able to say, Hey, and, and her family too, her family too was like, look, do it. You know, her sister happened to be going to Baylor at the time. And so I called, I literally called TCU, North Texas, SMU, and Baylor, which are basically all the, they're all within an hour or located in, in Dallas. And so I was like, look, cause she was going to stay in Dallas. So I was like, I'm going to try it. The only one that answered the phone, the only one that gave me a time of day was calling Schilling Law at uh, Baylor. And he was like, look, I can't guarantee anything. We just got this defensive coordinator, Phil Bennett. I can't, I don't, I don't know how he's going to react to it. He goes, I know you're not going to get it anything on the offensive side because you basically have to be family uh and i was like look i don't care i was like even if it just means i can help you and then maybe i can find a you know i knew that if i could just get in the room that i'd be okay and, and eventually that's kind of how that that came about and i got into school um i started working in the summer and eventually bennett you know asked who i was and he was interested in why, who i was because he always saw me reading a book every day as he walked by and I didn't want to be too forward and I didn't, you know, cause I was told, you know, just kind of sit in the office, you know, I'll, I'll give you some paperwork. You can help me out with some stuff. And, you know, if you get a chance to talk to coach Bennett, you know, talk to him. So I kind of getting to know everybody. I was there for a couple of weeks and then, you know, I kind of told Bennett my plan and uh, kind of what I was about. And he, he was, he was intrigued. So he's like, look, there's coming meetings. And then, then, you know, you fast forward to the season by about week four, I'm running our scout team. I'm doing most of our opponent scouting. Um, and I'm kind of taking the lead and all of that stuff. And, you know, being able to have that base uh, of knowledge and those connections uh, has just really been able to open the door for me and, and a lot of opportunities. I always wanted to be a writer. I didn't know what I wanted to write until um, probably around 2015 when I, did, I knew I wasn't going to be doing anything. And I was really bored because uh, I, I had a coaching tra- uh, changeover. You know, we've all been on, you know, most of us have been on staffs where a coach, head coach is fired. Just where I was at career wise and, and just with my family, I, I didn't want to leave the school I was at. Um, and so I decided to stay on, but I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of, I wasn't going to have a lot of say in what we were doing. So I had all these creative juices that I'd been working on, you know, really since I had been out of Baylor. And so that was kind of the genesis of match quarters was I had all this free time on my hand and I needed this creative outlet. And so that's when I started writing. And then I had all this, this kind of this basic knowledge and I started writing, you know, cautious aggression. My first book is really just taking what I learned at Baylor, right. And then that, the two years that I had, I had coached it in, in high school and just kind of writing that down. And, and what are my ideas on defending the, the modern spread option, you know, and, and, kind of putting that up pen to paper. So, you know, I've just been, I've been really lucky uh, and I've kind of found my passion and I've, you know, I've football's ever changing. So there's always things to write about. So that's, that's really, that's kind of my journey and, and how I got my start and how I was able to kind of get, get my feet wet in, in college football and, and, and really learn a lot about the game. Yeah, I think that's interesting what you said earlier about you're not going to be able to get on the offensive side of the ball unless you're family. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't, think, I didn't think nepotism ran that deep. Well, I know. I mean, it's not even like that. I mean, I, I think that if you go back and you look at that staff that I was at, that I was on, um, Dino Babers, who's at Syracuse, one of his best friends that he played with was Brian Norwood. Well, Brian Norwood was our safeties coach. Um, so, you know, it, you have a friend there and then, you know, Jeff Levy, who's now at Ole Miss, is married to uh, Art Brow's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you go down the line, you know, Randy Clements coached with Art Bryles back when they were in high school. Philip Montgomery, who's now at Tulsa, uh, coached with him back when he was at Stephenville. I mean, so a lot of those guys on that offensive side had been working with each other for decades, plural, gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, or were family. You know, like Kendall is obviously his son. So, you know, so to me, it was like, it, it just wasn't going to happen. 
Uh, and I mean, Schilling Law told me straight up, it's like, hey, look, it's just not, it's not going to happen. You, you can try. He said, you know, you can try, but he's like, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, it's going to be really hard for you to break in there. He's like, you might have more success on defense. And so for me, I was like, well, then that's fine. That's what I'll do. And then obviously that's, you know, getting to meet Phil Bennett, who is still a mentor of mine. I still talk to him on a regular basis. Uh, Jim Gush, who was a linebacker coach there as well at the time, you know, another mentor of mine. I talked to him. Uh, glad to see they're back in Dallas at North Texas. So, uh, and together. So it, to me, um, yeah, the, it just was the, it ended up all working at the same time. And I got lucky too. the NCAA passed that law where they added the extra GA to both sides of the ball. And so I was able to get that. So to me, I had good luck going in. I had bad luck going out. I, I was done with my GA my first year. I had, my, I had a son, so I couldn't, I couldn't stay and work for pennies like yeah. at the time. You know, all these analysts and these QC jobs that everybody has now, they just didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, so not, not at every program. I take that back. Not at every program. So, uh, for, so to me, it was um, – but still, I would never take anything back, and I wouldn't change my journey at all. At, at what point – so coming as the son of a coach and someone who has had the journey that you've had, at what point do you think you really considered yourself a student of the game? Like at what – do you have like one standout moment where you really were just possessed by the X's and O's and the strategy and the creativity that made you really want to dive deeper into it? Yeah, I would say probably around 11 or 12 when I really started – you know, when you start – you're kind of frontal lobe is starting to develop and you start really kind of getting these abstract ideas and you can kind of really understand the game at a deeper level other than, Hey, that's a really cool catch or Hey, that guy's really good. Cause he's really fast. Um, you can start seeing the X's and O's. My dad always, you know, my dad always preached, don't watch the ball, you know, watch the line, where are they going? What are guys doing? Why are they doing that? And so, you know, he, he would get me a spiral notebook and I would just start drawing up plays and, you know, learning, you know, 11 guys on the field, where's every, what's a three, four, what's a four, three, you know, what's a, what's a gap scheme, what's power, what's counter, uh, different formations and talking to my dad through, Hey, would this give you problems or, Hey, what would this look like? Now, and I, I, I grew up on, on the offensive side because my mm -hmm. dad is an offensive guy. I grew up playing defense. So really my passion for defense came in high school when we started running quarters coverage. Um, and, and the reading and the, and the rules. And, and to me as a DB, you know, I was, you know, very into that and wanted to know, you know, you know, man's easy, you know? And so I wanted to, to king this guy. And if he does this, we're going to do this. And the pattern matching stuff really is kind of when it went on the defensive side of the ball, I started really nerding out. And then on obviously in college, I just wanted more. I was probably a very abrasive college football player because I was constantly asking our coaches, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Um, looking back, you know, pro, you know, I'm a coach's son, so me and my dad have a relationship. I can, I can just kind of talk to him about. I was comfortable around coaches, which is probably, you know, probably a little too comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, but you know, a lot. Not every coach likes to be asked, "Hey, why are we doing this?" or "Hey, is there a better way of doing this?" "Hey, what do you think about this?" You know, and having that kind of that that camaraderie between player and coach and a lot of coaches don't especially me growing up i think coaches now my coaches that are my age you know i want a game plan with the kids because the kids are the ones that are playing this stuff and they're the ones that are doing it obviously i know the rules and i know what works and i know kind of the answers um but you know when they take ownership of that and they can they can sit there with you and they can start seeing the things that you need them to see in the game and have good questions and have good answers and come back and have ideas. I think that's when, and good ideas, you know, not just, Hey, let's do this or, Hey, let's do that. You know, but Hey, I saw this on YouTube. Can we do, you know, nothing like that, but have, you know, they understand the game plan at a deeper level because it's a collaborative effort. I think to me, that's what I needed as a, as a, as a player. And I never really got. And so now as a coach, that's what I always try and do is reach out and make sure that, the kids always feel like they're part of that. And I, I feel like that's kind of where my growth came from because I was always the nuts and bolts of, of football is what I wanted to know more about. And now that I'm a coach and I kind of have access to do that, that's, that's why I, I nerd out all the time. Do you still have any of your uh, plays that you used to write down when you were in junior high or high school, anything like that? Do you ever yeah, like, flip back to them? I have, I have some stuff like from back from, um, 
pre Baylor stuff and then some stuff in college that I was toying around with a coach on, on the staff was able to give me some playmaker pro. And I started drawing up some stuff. I have, I have some stuff, old stuff, old notebooks there, there somewhere, you know, I look back on it and I'm like, man, I had no idea, you know, now, you know, or man, you just, I can't, I can't, you can't do that now because you know, the offenses are doing this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is fun to go back and look and just kind of the evolution. And even with, uh, you know, with my first book in cautious aggression, you know, it was like five years ago, you know, to see kind of the growth that I've had as a coach and just as, you know, go back and read. I still think it's a great book. Um, and I still think the philosophy works. There's a lot of coaches that read it and, and use it, the philosophy in it and win a lot of games. So, I mean, to me, not a lot has changed from that. So it, it, but it's fun to see kind of even just in my thought process, how I've evolved or just even as a writer too, mm-hmm. just how I've evolved. So just, it's fun to always look back at that stuff and see kind of that growth. Cause I feel like you, you never want it to stay the same. Cause you can't you either, you're either moving forward or, or you're, you're, moving down. I, I would rather move forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's like those, uh, those old playbooks are almost like mementos to mm-hmm. like a, a time when you were just really getting into it and really trying to learn everything you could. Yeah. And, and to me, that's kind of the, I've been lucky to, you know, I, I grew up in the old school, like kind of that four, four mm-hmm. kind of the old Nebraska defenses with a Rover and a rush end and, kind of a lot of people were, were kind of doing the four, four stuff. And then in college, I ran a lot of odd stack. I seemed to always be in an odd stack off uh, defense. And then um, kind of did that at the beginning of my, uh, at my, my kind of high school career and then being able to live in the four down world at Baylor. And then now, since I've been out kind of that hybrid four down three down world at the high school level, it's just kind of, you know, and now I'm in the three high safety system. So I've, I've just been exposed to everything. I just love it. And just kind of, you know, I always tell people all the time, you know, take, take what you, your base, learn something, you know, so you can have a home base and then try and prove it wrong constantly and whatever sticks, then, you know, is best practice. And then, you know, that that's, that you're, you're kind of cooking with gas at that point. Yeah, I, I agree. It's like the, uh, like the old Bruce Lee, uh, line, be like water. You know, it's like, you want to try to get everything you can and try to incorporate it into your base. Well, and I think too, there as a young coach, you, you know, I would, we just didn't have, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you just didn't have clinics like you have now. Um, you know, you had a few, you don't have the virtual stuff. And, and, but to me, it was just, you get these new ideas and, and everything. And you're just like, Oh, okay, well, this is the new thing. Then it's, this is the new thing. And that, you know, it's, and you don't really, you know, a lot of young guys hop around and they don't learn a base and they just, they're, they're accumulating information but there's not really any substance behind it. It's like a, you know, it looks like this massive expanse, but really when you wade into it, it's not very deep. You know, it only comes up to the ankle. Like, yeah, look at it. This looks really nice. You have this huge, you have this huge ocean, what looks like it, but it's about ankle deep. You know, it's just spread over, spread out. You know, you don't have this deep knowledge of something. And so to me, it's always, I would rather, I would rather know the nuts and bolts of it. And then, Hey, this is a better way of teaching it than what I'm doing now. I'm going to steal that. Or, Hey, this makes sense versus this look, or this makes sense versus that. And then kind of constantly be changing. Cause I tell guys all the time, if you're doing the same thing now, 10 years from now, you know, where are you going to be? You know, I, you know, we're constantly moving. So if you're doing the same thing and you never change, well, then you're probably getting worse. You're not, probably not getting better. And so I think, you know, that to me, learning more about bias has been something I started in about 2018. Started really studying about, you know, cognitive biases. How can, how am I, the way that things are presented to me and my upbringing and then just kind of where I've come as a, my upbringing as a coach, how does that challenge my ideas? you know, and constantly poking and prying, trying to be more cognizant of why is this affecting me? Why don't I like this? You know, and then kind of looking at things and, okay, am I looking at a logo or am I looking at, Hey, this is really good stuff because they're elite teachers, you know? And I think to me that, you know, that to me is something that I'm constantly looking for and I'm, I'm constantly afraid that I'm a hack. And so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better every day. You know, that to me, that's 
to me that's um, the goal almost like imposter syndrome yes yes I, oh man yeah the, definitely like i'm constantly panicky about oh my gosh i'm such a fraud so how can i get better and like oh, i need to learn this so i mean and to me that's what keeps me motivated that's what keeps me moving forward i want to be the best you know i want to be you know i i, I want to be considered one of the best and so to me that that kind of that pride and that thing you know that I'm constantly afraid of, man, I don't want to be a hack. I don't want to be a fraud. And so how can I, how can I constantly push myself forward? And if I do fail, I'm at least going to fall forward. You know, like I wrote in cautious aggression. I mean, that, that to me, people might look at my time as a GA as, as not a success, but if I don't have my time as a GA, I don't write match quarters. I don't have all these different connections that I have now. Um, because I'll admit, I used to be that guy that was like, oh, well, if you, you're a GA and you didn't get a full-time job, then then you must be, you know, there's something wrong with you. Well, mm -hmm. here I am. You know, I had to look at a hard, hard look in a mirror. Here I am. Three years later, I didn't get a full-time job. So what does that mean for me? Am I am I a hack? And I didn't feel like I was. So, you know, to me, it's, it's again, it's kind of going back to, you know, you got to kind of look at everything objectively and move forward. Yeah, I think people who have no self-awareness whatsoever are the only people who don't have that imposter syndrome feel at some point in their lives. You know, I think everybody wants to kind of move forward and show their worth, but you always kind of feel, all right, is this really me? Am I really contributing anything valuable to this? Yeah, yeah, you know, you have those highs where like, dude, I got this. And then you have those, yeah. oh man, I'm, I am, must be a total fraud. You know, and I've had that before I talked to the guys at the Run the Power podcast um, that they, they do a really good job. That was one of the things that um, I had talked to them about that I had done a clinic for them on on trip stuff. And um, that after I got done with the click, the clinic with them, I, I was on such a high. I was like, man, we did all this crazy stuff and we were really successful. And then I, and then I started getting more into analytics and I was like, man, we were not very good. And I was like, I felt like to a total fraud. And so then, you know, that really, that motivated me and that motivation, I totally redid everything. I broke everything down the way I was teaching things, the way I was approaching things, the way that I was communicating with the athletes. The, our, my system was I running the wrong system, you know, because again, that anchor bias of I learned the system at Baylor. We were very successful at Baylor, but is this the correct system for what I need to be doing at the high school level? And that is the genesis of match quarters, which is basically my dissertation on split field coverage. I mean, it, it's, it's essentially three years of work at Midlothian with, with basically putty as kids that are great kids. Um, and just being able to do whatever I wanted for three years and being able to, from that kind of that, I need to redo everything, ask them more questions. And, and that's kind of where match quarters came from. Um, it's kind of like you said, that imposter syndrome stuff of just like, oh man, I'm a total fraud. I need to re reevaluate this. I need to make sure. But then writing it all down and teaching it because I think the best way to learn is to teach. And so, you know, putting that all together in a, in a book, I think it was, has, again, coming from that imposter syndrome stuff, it, it, you know, if you're not moving forward, then you're getting stagnant. Well, it's a, did you ever read the book Thinking Fast and Slow? I'm 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 waiting through it right now. I'm waiting yeah. through it right now. I read it in bits. I read it in spurts. But yes, it, it's it's very intriguing to me. It's like the same thing. It was like the, like one part of your brain is very just receptive to the easy thinking. You know, it's like the one plus one equals two. And it's like as a coach, you know, it's like you've been doing something for so long. You think, okay, well, I can just try to tailor this to whatever offense, but that's not always going to be the case. You know, you have to kind of go deeper and try to look at something new beyond what you already know to try to formulate and go deeper into some new territory to like have that success with the evolution of the game. So I yeah. think it's interesting how you bring up kind of like cognitive bias and how it kind of influences you as a coach too. Yeah. I, I think coaching world just in general, it's, it's such a big deal. And I don't think a lot of coaches understand the way that they approach things. I mean, we see it on Twitter all the time with people just fighting with each other about dumb <laughs> stuff. You know, it's like, look, yeah, that works for coach a and coach B at the college level, but some of us may not be able to have that or be able to do that, or we don't see that kind of offense. You know, what you see RPO wise may be rudimentary compared to what I see here at six, a in, in Texas, which has been running RPOs since, you know, the early 2000s. So 
you know, to me, the evolution in different re- in the regional, the way that football is regionally, that's what I love about the platform right now and where I'm at as a, just a contributor to the game is that I get to talk to people all over the place that have so many different issues that, you know, I'm talking to a coach over here that, man, I haven't had that issue in, you know, five years, but they're having that issue right now. And that's where they are in the evolutionary tree of their, their game in their state. So to me, it's constantly, again, that cycling back of I'm constantly having to remember these things. And, and, and I think as me, that helps you as you go into a game and as you go into a game plan of, um, you know, oh, I've seen this before, or I've, I've taught in that deliberate practice of different things and different scenarios constantly that I, I wouldn't be able to get if I just was like, nope, I only watch this team. I only believe in this system and everything else is I've got, you know, I've got my blinders on. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard you say on other uh, interviews that coaching in Texas is like, uh, it's like you're hired to be fired. Is, is that fair to say? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, especially at the six, a five, a level, I think, you know, and then some schools at the four, a level, I I think obviously there's programs at every level that if you're not winning, you're probably going to get fired. You know, six, a football, five, a football here in the state is probably the closest that you can get to division one football um, outside of, you know, outside of actually coaching in division one football. I would say that, you know, some of our coaches, mo- most of our coaches at the five, a six, a level are paid better than, than you would at a, at a one double a school if you were just a regular position coach. Um, so I, I do think, you know, I think that there is something to it. You know, we're getting paid well, we have really nice facilities. We have great kids. Uh, you know, there's division one kids at, at a lot of these programs, you know, even, even the ones that aren't very good. And I think, you know, outside of out of some districts, I think football is very important. And you are that that kind of you're constantly being pushed. And if you're not winning, then, you know, you're not going to be there for very long. There's very few districts that don't care enough that they're not going to at least push their coaches to try and get better. Do you think that to succeed in that environment, I mean, you came from outside Texas and now you, know, yes. you, you have success as a coach, but do you think by and large, you almost have to be kind of like be born and raised in that environment to really understand the grind that it takes to succeed in a state like Texas where football is king? Yeah, I, I do. I think that, you know, I think a lot of people come to this state with hopes of being, you know, I've been a varsity coach in this state for 10 years. I'm going to move to Texas and I'm just going to become, I'm going to be able to just be a a varsity coach, or I've been a coordinator at this, at this, at this level, at this state, and I'm just going to move to Texas and, or I'm going to be able to, to put my resume in and somebody's going to give me a phone call. That's just not the case. I mean, people will tell you all the time, it doesn't matter unless you know somebody, you're probably going to have to start at the middle school level or the freshman level just wow. until they get to know you. I mean, and, and, and I, I deal with it too, just because I'm not, I'm not from the state. I can't call my dad. I can't call my head coach from, from high school. I can't call my coaches from high school and say, Hey, do you know this guy? Or, Hey, can you help me? Hey, I heard this job's open. Like I, you know, so to me, you know, I, I there's guys that have been around that I've met that are not from the state that came, you know, kind of about the same time I did in their mid twenties. And, yeah, they've kind of had the same experience. You kind of have to be indoctrinated in it. You know, there's still a lot of coaches around here that feel like if you're not from the state, then you've got to kind of have to cut your teeth at the lower levels and prove your worth and move up unless you're just from some unnamed program uh, around the country or you know somebody. So, yeah, it, it is a little different. Uh, it's it's serious business here. Football, for the most part, is on the front porch at a lot of programs, and it's important, and they're, they're building these nice facilities, and – you know, they're, they've got a lot of people at these games and there's a lot of investment in, in the community in a lot of these places too. So does that outsider, do you, I mean, do you carry that outsider mentality with you? Not necessarily like as a chip on your shoulder, but you know, you're in probably the most competitive state for high school football and really football in general. And you've been able to really make a name for yourself. I mean, do you kind of use that as a sort of badge of honor in a way? I mean, yeah, I mean, you could say a bad one. I, I mean, I really would say just chip on the shoulder. I mean, you know, I am an outsider, even in the state, you know, so I try and I try and always just be real cognizant of that. I've just said not everybody, not everybody knows me here in the state or not everybody has, you know, kind of people look at you with a side eye, like, who is this guy? You know, he's not really from here. Or I don't know him or where did he come from? Where did you play football at? You know, it's just, 
you know, and, and I can't, I'm from Kansas city, Missouri. And it's like, Oh, what, what okay. You know, like barbecue, right. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so to me, it's, it is a little bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a badge of honor. Um, cause I'm not where I want to be at all. Um, and not yet. And I hope that I never get to where I feel comfortable where I'm at. And so to me, it's more of a chip of like, I really have to prove myself. I really have to have my A game on all the time because in this state, you know, and they tell, I mean, I'll never forget, you know, Don Brown at the Lone Star Clinic in 2017, you know, he was talking to Greg Mattis, you know, about coming down here and talking. It was the first time he had been to Texas to do a clinic. And, you know, they said, look, if you go down there, you can't just give them the regular clinic talk that you give everybody else. you got to go down there. you got to talk football. So whatever you were going to talk about, don't. You need to talk football. You need to have film. You need to talk X's and O's. And you need to talk about actual football because you're talking about some of the most elite coaches in the country are going to be sitting in there and they're going to call you out if it, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's not good. And so, you know, or if it's just fluff, they're going to get up and leave. And it's true. I've been, I've been in clinics where, especially in Texas, where man, guy starts coming in and you're like, okay, this is the generic, you know, this is the generic, you know, clinic that I give to, you know, 10 times a year. And it's like, guys will just get up and leave. Right. You know, so I do think, I do think in the state, you know, there's a little bit of, and to me too, you know, it's good and bad. It's good in the sense that there's kind of this uh, elite attitude of always pushing forward, but at the same time, there's a little bit of an elitist attitude towards it too. You know, so you kind of have to guys like me, or it's going to take a little longer to, to be successful and that's okay. Cause not everybody's path is the same. And I think once you quit judging yourself against other people, that's when true happiness starts, starts to find it. Yeah, the best competition you can have is competition with yourself, undoubtedly so, yeah. Yeah, I think also kind of like how obviously some people have it easier because they are connected, but, you know, that just kind of gives you a little bit more of experience and how to handle situations like that and kind of makes it more gratifying at the end of the road or even along the road. Well, and too, like, you know, to me, I look back at my first job, you know, I was – I was lucky enough to get a co-defensive coordinator role right out of, right out of Baylor, you know, cause I, and I had this just attitude. It was so stupid. I had an opportunity to take a job at a really good program that was brand new. It was on the rise. It's one of the better programs in the state now. Um, but it was a brand new program at the time. I wasn't going to be the defense coordinator. I wasn't, I, I was going to be able to run the secondary. Um, and they were interested in what we were doing at Baylor quarters wise, things like that. And then I had this other opportunity at a school, wasn't very good at football, wasn't a great program, but I was going to be able to be the coordinator. And, you know, you kind of had that bravado of a 25, 26 year old of like, oh, well, I can fix anything. And I just walked into a hornet's nest. It wasn't good personally. It wasn't good for coaching. It wasn't good at all. And so for me, you know, it, it was very humbling in that humbling experience of, look, you're not a savior. We're not, we're not saviors. It's, we're more of, a, you know, we're there to we're there as coaches we're there as, as a conduit to help these kids grow and i'm not a savior you know and so to me to have that kind of that messiah complex of like oh, i'm going to save this program i'm coming i'm going to do this and and really being able to kind of have that humbling experience i think is important um because i you know and kind of having to grow from that and how i've how i've been able to kind of grow as a coach every year and different experiences and things like that going through a, a, a transition at uh, Lovejoy where the head coach gets fired and I stay on, you know, things like that. It, it just, I, all these experiences have grown. And so when I do get my opportunity, I feel like I'm now ready. Whereas my first opportunity, I, I look back at it and it's like, man, I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready to handle it. I still had resentment for not making it. You know, I still, you know, at Baylor, like there's a lot of things going on emotionally with me. I wasn't ready for that job. You know, I should have taken the other job and been in a stable program, had some mentors, been able to bring myself up instead of just saying like, here, take this and run with it, you know? And so, you know, I've, I've told people before, like, don't, don't chase titles, chase programs, learn a program, find a mentor, be in a good, you know, some of these jobs, some of these schools here, it's better to be a position coach than it is to be a coordinator at a different school. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's always important to remember that the grass isn't always green or, or the title, it doesn't always make the man, you know, I, I, and I learned that as a 26 year old, the really, really the hard way, you know? So to me, I, you know, I think it's important, uh, 
for me to to understand that and, and to grow from that. And I think it's important to talk about it because we're not, you know, I think so many people want to just sit here and say, look, I'm Mr. Perfect or I've had this perfect thing. And, and it's not like that at all. That's not life. That's not real. You know, I talk to the kids all the time about my personal things that have happened in my life that maybe that relates to what they're going through, that we've all fallen, we've all failed, but that's the only way we learn. You know, if everything's always great. We're never going to learn. And when that, when you do fall, that falls a lot harder because you fall from a little bit higher up. Yeah. Not, not every day could be Christmas, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is, is there, go ahead. go ahead. No, I mean, but you're, you're completely right. You know, it's not a video game, you know? Yeah. Now, do you think that there's something rewarding or maybe, maybe not rewarding, but something satisfying about coaching high school that you can't find in coaching college football? Yeah, because you're getting them at the beginning of their the beginning of the journey, um, and I and I think that that's kind of the difference between the levels. You know, at the high school level, you're really getting them at the beginning of the journey. You're you're building that foundation. You know, when they go to the college level, that's kind of solidifying that house. They're building their house. You know, and I'm hoping that I send them off with a good foundation for them to build that house on. That at least that they've got something that they can hold on to or somebody that they know that they can always have their back. You know, I teach, I've, I've, I teach and I've coached kids that come from nothing and I've teached and I've coached kids that have everything in the world. You know, I've, I've taught and coached kids that need me and I've taught and I've coached kids that don't need me at all. So, you know, to me to be able to just say, look, I'm no matter what, I'm always going to be that level, that level headed person for you, that rock for you. But I do think at the high school level, that's more rewarding. I think at the college level, especially at the higher levels, it's all about getting to the NFL and how can I get to the NFL and how can I do this or getting that edge. And so sometimes you kind of get, you know, winning that championship and it kind of gets that, that, that pressure gets built up a little bit more. So it's more of a kind of a laser focus. You're not necessarily worrying. Obviously culture matters in everything. Um, but I think even at some of these programs that have great cultures, it, you know, Alabama, it's about making it to the NFL. I mean, listen to Nick Saban in a, in a recruiting pitch. I mean, it's about making it to the league. It's about competing and, and doing things like that. So, I mean, to me, I think that's the biggest difference. And then obviously at the professional level, you're dealing with adult men that are getting paid, paid to play. And so yeah. that relationship is completely different. Yeah. Um, and so, so, yeah, I think at the high school level, it is really rewarding because they kind of need you at that moment. And then every level you go up, they need you less and less. Yeah. Well, I, you hear also, you know, players when they still keep in touch with like their high school coach or even sometimes their youth football coach. So it just goes to show, I mean, you're you're really coming in their lives at a very formative time. So it's like, you know, you really want to be that kind of, you know, silver lining in their life that can make a difference. Yeah, I mean, because you look at yourself in high school and just how much of a, a, a yeah. you know, a, a, I, was, I was a total turd, you know, I was an idiot. So it's like, I look back, I'm like, geez, you know, I'm glad I had Coach Pugh, you know, Coach Charlie Pugh, who was my DB coach at the time. Um, you know, I, I talk to him when I see him. So, you know, uh, Chad Freegan, who's still, the, he's the head coach at Liberty. He's, you know, he was a coach while I was there. I mean, so I, I, I still talk to my high school coaches. Um, in that relationship and that bond of, of being from your hometown, you know, I hope everybody has that. And I want, I want, at least for me personally, that those kids know that five, 10, 15 years down the road, coach A always has their back. Coach A is always going to pick up the phone. You know, that, that to me, I think is, that to me is important. Yeah, undoubtedly so. And and your career as a writer, because you you talked earlier about doing match quarters, the blog that you were writing. Why did you decide to put your information in the form of a book if you had kind of a platform to say what you were thinking about various football topics on your website? Well, I think I think the book gives you just a I like the feel of a book. I like to hold it in my hand um, and I like to be able to flip through the pages. I'm not one that dog ears or writes in books. But I do like the having that all that knowledge in one spot that I don't have to search for it. It's put in a in a sequential order. Um, but yeah, I you know I got that from Chris Brown who watched who wrote Smart Football and uh, was on Grantland. You know I was lucky enough that he liked a lot of my stuff early on, and and we we kind of talked early in my career just as a writer. 
And, you know, one of the things he says, just, just write every day and then kind of put your, your foundational pieces together and put it in a book. And so that's what I really started doing. I said, okay, let's start writing what I believe in football wise and then test it out in the worst place, which is the internet. And then whatever <laughs> it sticks or, you know, and some people started liking it. And so I was like, okay, well, then I, I, you get enough information, you start putting it into a book. Um, and so that's kind of why I like the book. Um, obviously, the other part of it is just the, being able to, I think it it reaches a, a far wider, hey, look at this book, you know, hey, I got this book. You know, I think to me, it's just being able to kind of have something solid, concrete, here's everything right here, you know, instead of piecing, piecemealing articles together off of a blog and hopefully you've bookmarked them and things like that. You know, to me, I want everything nice and concise and, and, and in a in a sequential order. And so putting it in a book just kind of kind of puts the, you know, the end note on it. And when you were writing hybrids, your inspiration partly had come from a book that you had read about the simultaneous speed and space revolution going on in all team sports. Is yeah. Right? What, Fer what, Fergus what, what was the background about that book? Changer. Yeah, so Fergus Conley, who's he was at Michigan for a while. He's one of the most he's one of the more renowned um, sports psychologists and kind of sports scientists. He kind of he wrote a textbook on team sports and just the movement in between it. And while I'm reading this, I'm like, this is all the stuff that we were doing at Baylor at the time, and it really kind of resonated with me. And I just was like, look, foot. This is where football's moving towards. You know, football's moving towards space sports. It's moving towards multiple hybrids, like people that can play multiple positions. Nobody's really running a four down or a three down anymore. You know, you're kind of, you know, all 11 people on the field, really, except for the field corner, can be used in a blitz. You know, and some people use the field corner in a blitz. Um, but to me, it was like, I'm reading this, this textbook, and I'm like, this is where football's headed. And I was like, I need to start researching about this. And I wanted to do it on hybrids and the different ways that things have evolved. And while I started doing research, I just was like, you know, it, it just kind of put itself together, the history of defense and and then kind of where we are with the Iowa State system and the, the three high stuff that you see on every Saturday um, and kind of where that's going. And so to me, that's kind of where the genesis of that book came from. And, and what about the genesis of hybrid players and how they came in, into um, being in demand for football teams? Who, who were some of the original hybrid players that really kind of opened the eyes to coaches that not everybody is going to fit into these neat little boxes, into these traditional positions? Well, I think the, the, the first place that they always are found is on offense. And I think the tight end changed a lot of the things you know, with, with like Kellen Winslow and, and then I, but the biggest one for me was Lawrence Taylor. And I think Lawrence Taylor is, you know, everything goes in a straight line and mm -hmm. then you get Lawrence Taylor and then everything starts branching out. And I think Lawrence Taylor um, will go down as one of the most important football players of all time, just because of the way that he influenced the game in terms of, the position that he played. Um, Orange Barger obviously was doing some of this hybrid stuff back in the seventies with, with Bill Mathis, which is why they call it the 53 defense. But I don't think he even thought of where it would eventually go with Dick LeBeau using secondary players and fire zones and, and kind of that whole evolution of things. Um, and then obviously with, with Lawrence Taylor changing the game, just from you don't have now you have a player that can can rush, but he can also is athletic enough to cover somebody if you need him to. Obviously, you don't want your bell cow covering a bunch of people, but you have that opportunity now. It just adds another layer to the game, um, and I think you kind of go through that whole deal of you know quarterbacks that are mobile. You know, eventually now now everybody needs a mobile quarterback. You know, and you kind of go through these evolutions of these different, these different kind of things. And yeah, you have the prototype, but then you have these guys that like kind of break the mold. Um, and I think Lawrence Taylor's kind of that, that where you get that branch that starts saying, oh, here's one way. And then, okay, Lawrence Taylor opened up a completely brand new door. Um, but he, to 
me is kind of defensively anyway, that's the change. He when he showed up, it was just it was it took Orange Barger's ideas and philosophy and it just it put it on steroids. Yeah, and you point that out in the book how he, he was kind of the reason why Joe Gibbs had to kind of build a two tight end offense and have like yo know, that H back. Um, yeah. and, and it's it's crazy because you know when you look at like New England in 2010, 2011 when they had Gronk and Hernandez, you know, in, in some ways you kind of think you know Lawrence Taylor who was you know Bill's player back in the 80s with the Giants, you know, it's almost like he was in some way ir- like indirectly responsible for something like that. Yeah, so it's crazy and, to think. And now look at what we're seeing with all the 12 personnel now, 21 personnel stuff that we see all over the place. I mean. It, to, to me, it's just, a again, it's that flat circle in time. We're back to kind of that, you know, you need to have the the off tight end, the H back and all that stuff. And now we're, we're back to a little bit more of a heavier, uh, but it's in a different era and it's more hybrid and it's more skilled and it's more spatially aware. You know, I call it spatial Darwinism. <laughs> you know, you the evolution of space. You either know how to how to get it or to create it, or you know how to constrain it. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. And it's that I think those coaches going forward are going to be the ones that that are going to be the next great coaches. It, it, going to like the early days of football, like the days of like the double wing, the single wing the you know short punt do you think that though that era could also be considered a time for hybrid players because you would have you know people in the backfield who could excel in all dimensions of the game and i think in some cases even before the shifting laws got really strict you would have some linemen even go into the backfield and take a handoff like do you think that period could also count i think i think the hybrid player has always been there i just think that now we have an appreciation for it because of where we are just in the evolutionary scheme of things like we're now to the point where football is a space sport you have you're using all 53 and a third so we're we're very similar to the nba we're very similar to soccer we finally caught up to the space the original space sports um and so now those hybrid players are now a premium those tweeners that were like yeah yeah okay he's special or you had to be really special in order to succeed um, and, and be able to break that mold. I think now it's kind of like, I need a, a hybrid. You have to be a hybrid. You have to be able to do this and you have to be able to do that. You can't just be a one trick pony. You know, I think even just, you know, just even with the last five years of the third down edge rusher, well, I'm not going to pay that guy millions of dollars just to r- rush the passer only on third down. He's got to be able to kind of play and cover. I mean, look at what, what, Fox has done in Denver or not, uh, not Fox, but uh, Fangio has done in Denver with, with Von Miller, you know, Von Miller drops back into coverage sometimes. And, and, but he also rushes the passer and, and when he is healthy, he, he gets, he gets, um, you know, he gets a lot of sacks, you know, what, what uh, Staley did with, with uh, Aaron Donald, moving him around and using him and, and using Ramsey as kind of these levers on defense to kind of constrain the space for the offense. You know, I think nowadays that's the that's the prototype of we want guys that can do multiple things. And if you can only do one thing, you better be really, really good at it. You better be elite at it because otherwise there's going to be somebody else that can do that as well as you do. And they can also add value somewhere else. And it's kind of that add value mentality. It's what I tell my players all the time. You have to be able to add value. If you're not adding value, somebody eventually is going to catch you. And once they catch you, you're done. Then it's over. And you hear oftentimes, or as a fan, you often hear that uh, a scheme can overcome a lack of talent. So I'm curious, number one, do you, do you agree with that? And number two, if you do agree with it, do you think that could still be the case moving forward because you have a more heavier reliance on players that are more athletic and quicker and faster? I think when when things are close, scheme can even it up or allow you to surpass the talent. But I mean, I, I coach high school football. I see it every weekend. All right. You know, I see it every week is that there's, you know, there's a lot of guys that, that, you know, maybe this team's not very well coached, but they've got the best players and they tend to win. Um, you know, that I, that the kids are overcoming. I mean, I mean, I tell people all the time, you know, sometimes the kids are successful despite of the coach. 
you know, I think that we have this fallacy of just the coaches are the only things that are, make things, you know, and like I told you, you know, ask me when I first left Baylor, I would have told you I could save any, any program, just hire me, I'll fix it, you know, but no, you have to have talent, you know, and I learned that the hard way. You got to have talent. And if you don't have talent, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You could have the best scheme in the world, but if you don't have the talent to do it, then it, or to execute, then it doesn't matter. Um, you know, so to me, you know, watching the growth of the kids that I had at Midlothian, we weren't very good my first year there. And the reason why we weren't very good was because we were really young. We were talented, but we were young. We were younger than everybody. We were smaller than everybody. We were slower than everybody. Fast forward two years. You know, we're one of the best two years Midlothians had ever. Why? That group of kids was one of the winningest classes that that, that school's ever had. So to me, it, the talent was there. You know, it wasn't necessarily what we were doing. Or not. We were running the flex bone on offense, and we were running, you know, a solid defense. It wasn't the greatest scheme. It wasn't the most advanced. We weren't doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff. So, I mean, it's mm-hmm. not – so I think that there's a fallacy in coaching that you know, that kind of that messiah complex of the, the, you know, that scheme trumps everything. No, talent. Talent trumps everything. The scheme allows you to e- surpass teams that are within your st- within striking distance, you know. So speaking of scheme, like what do you see as sort of like the next revolution in football? Like what do you see either now or maybe something you haven't seen a whole lot of but you think could be possible that could just take the game by storm? I think people are going to start moving back to a four man front um, with, with the way that teams are, are stacking the box and then running, running duo and these downhill runs. I think you're going to see more four down stuff, but it's going to be, again, it's going to be more hybridized fluid fronts um, taking that three down mentality of that, you know, stack fall back kind of ball fit mentality and putting it into the four down for four down world, which is something that's been different. You know, most, a lot of four down guys are single gap guys. And it's like, you have this gap, you have this gap, you have this gap. Well, what that's great. What happens if the gaps move? What happens when, you know, you don't always want to put your D end on the, on the quarterback. Um, I, you know, you go look at like Georgia this year, for instance, played a ton of four down. Um, I think Baylor played a little bit more four down. Than they normally would. Uh, Louisiana, who was playing a bunch, you know, who comes from the Arena Tree, uh, Patrick Tony, who I know really well. They t- they ran a ton of four down. Um, I think that you're start. It, it's just something that's evolving. I don't think the three high safety stuff is going away. I think for teams that it's e- it's hard to recruit D linemen. It's easier to recruit skill positions. There's just more of them. Um, elite big bodies. Just there's not there's not a lot of them. And so when you find them, you pay them. I mean, that's why the NFL, I mean, you you find a guy like Aaron Donald, you pay him. J.J. Watt, you pay him. Von Miller, you pay him. Miles Garrett, you pay him. You you know, you go Mm -hmm. down the line, you pay him because they just don't exist. They're they're aliens. I mean, if you have ever seen, go Google Miles Garrett in high school and go look what he looked like. He was an alien. He did not look normal versus another, like, you know, as a high school football player. And so to me, it's like, you know, these, I don't think the three high systems going away. I think it kind of is, it's not an equalizer per se, but it does allow teams to get more speed on the field. And then it's something that's more recruitable at that level. Um, I think, but I do think that you're going to see because of that, the answer on offense is going to be to get bigger. And obviously if you get bigger, the, the answer on defense is to, to get bigger. And that first part is to go four down. I don't think we'll ever get back to kind of the five, two days that we saw in the nineties of just three, three yards in a cloud of dust. Um, I think people in analytics have, have pretty much shown that you need to pass the ball to win the game. Um, and so to me, I think that's kind of where, where we're going. I think you're going to just it, it, things cycle back and forth, you know, middle field close is becoming really popular quarters. Isn't as popular. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with, um, it, it's kind of the the reversal of what's going on in the NFL. I think the NFL is running more two high systems because you're, they're seeing more crossing routes because you're, they're seeing more cover three beaters because everybody's kind of caught up to, okay, well, everybody's running middle of the field closed or man. So we're going to run a ton of crossing routes and do different things. And so I think you're seeing more quarters in the NFL. That, But I do think at the college level, you're seeing more uh, cover one, middle field closed, Defenses, cover three is becoming more popular. 
Um, so, I, so to me, it, there, it's always cycle, it's cyclical. Ten years ago, where everybody was running quarters, or everybody wanted to run quarters, um, or some variation of it, or you know, it was a heavy reliance, and now they're kind of going the other way. So, you know, because to me, all the Tampa two stuff is out of that three high. That's just three cloud. You're just doing it in a different way. It's still, it's still middle of the field closed. Everything's coming full circle, right? Exactly. Do you have any plans to write another book? Oh yeah, I'm sure I will. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I probably would like to put one out in November. I don't know. I haven't really started. I'll probably do something this, this summer. If I don't have it out in November, maybe January, like I did this year. I don't know. I have, I've got a few ideas, nothing solid yet. So nothing I can drop on here and be like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Be looking for it. Um, but I got a few ideas that I'm toying around with. So the la last question I have is what is your ultimate goal as a coach? Cause you know, I, I read your books and I see like the passion that you have invested in, in this conversation. You know, you, you have a, a pretty unique journey into how you really got into, to where you are now. So what is your ultimate goal? Like, is there a certain position or do you have certain milestones that you want to accomplish in, in your coaching career? You know, that's kind of the catch 22. I mean, the, the higher you go up, the less time that you have to do kind of the fun stuff that I get to do now. You know, I've talked to a couple of coaches that, you know, when I got this position here at Horn, you know, the co-DC people are like, Oh, we don't want you to be the DC. We want, you know, we want you to don't, don't go, you know, get all busy on us and, and, you know, quit riding and things like that. And, um, you know, you start becoming a head coach and, and you start realizing, you know, when you, when you move up there, you, you coach less and less and you start doing more managerial stuff. I mean, obviously I would love to coach professionally. I love to coach full time. Um, but you know, if something in the media opened up and somebody wanted me to write full time or do something like that, you know, I would have to really think about it seriously. Um, I, I, you know, to me, I'm open, I'm an open book. I, you know, I've, I've, I've gone a long time trying to put a square peg in a round hole and just kind of forcing my way into doing things. And I've, I've, you know, I've kind of learned, you know, you know, having three kids will do this to you too. You just kind of have to go with the flow. Like you said, with Bruce Lee, you got to be like water uh, and just kind of go with the flow. But do I have goals and aspirations as a, as a coach? Yeah. I want to be one of the best. I want to be considered one of the best um, at what I do. Um, especially, you know, I want to be considered one of the better deep, defensive back coaches in the country. I want to be considered a, you know, somebody that's forward thinking and innovative and, you know, so that motivates me. Um, you know, to, I want to be a great defensive coach. You know, I do want to be a coordinator. I want to call my own defense, you know, and, and do my own thing and be able to put my stamp on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have goals um, and, but, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I've learned, the hard way that you don't want to force the issue and you want to let things come to you. And, and, and when opportunity knocks, then you take, you know, you think about it and you, you take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, do what you have to do today and tomorrow will take care of itself. Right. Right. You know, take, take care of, you know, you know, and, and that's that thing, the whole deal is, you know, I, I think a lot of people use the term be, you know, be where your feet are and kind of a, they want you to, you know, be loyal and do all that. You know, I kind of look at it like in terms of, you know, be present. Don't just be present. Don't just show up and, and, and tick the box, but be present where you are. The other stuff will come. Um, but you do have to have a goal. You do have and you do have to have a process of attaining that goal because other, otherwise it's just a wish. And we all know how wishes uh, kind of see this isn't a fairy. This isn't a fairy tale. Absolutely, man. Well, do you want to tell people where they can uh, read your stuff, where they can get the book, what your website is? Yeah. So, you know, the original website is matchquarters.com. If you go to matchquarters.com, you'll see kind of the original blog posts. Um, if you click on the links tab, it'll take you to all, every article that I've ever written um, that isn't in a book. Uh, you can find me on Amazon. Just type in Cody Alexander in books. You can find me. You can find me there. Um, Obviously, Match Quarters and, and Amazon will, will take you there as well. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the underscore coach underscore A. You know, I put out a ton. I try and put out something. I try and create something every day that's useful. Uh, that's kind of my goal. Uh, and then I, you know, I moved Match Quarters into a sub stack, which is uh, really just a subscription based. You know, I, you have two ways of doing it. You, you have the free subscription, which I do send out free things a couple times. Uh, 
couple times a month, but I do have some of my uh, meteor articles. I, I, I do have a, sub, a subscribers uh, and I've, I've tried to make it affordable for coaches. I am a coach myself. I have a family too. So um, you can find me at matchquarters.substack.com on there too, if that's interesting, because that's where, that's where mo- all of my new stuff is, is going. Cool, Cody. This was awesome to talk to you. I encourage everybody to get the book. This was an informative conversation. Really loved hearing about your football journey. And I want to have you back on when you write that next book. All right. Yeah. And I appreciate it. And I think it's important for a lot of people to understand, you know, you know, I think a lot of people see coaches and, and all they do is talk football and scheme. I think it's important, you know, and that's why I intrigued to talk to you because it, it, we really didn't talk much about scheme at all. You know, obviously evolution of football was, was a part of it. And but just kind of the journey and part, I think it's important for people to understand who you are as a human um, and that human element to things I think is important as well. Very much agreed. I'm glad you decided to come on. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, man. All right. You have a good one. Thank you.